10 Facts About Giants and the Nephilim Number 1. The Nephilim Originated from Demonic Origins The term Nephilim appears twice in the Bible, first in Genesis and then again in Numbers. According to scholars and commentators, the word can be translated to mean either giants or fallen ones. The origins of angels differ from those of humans as they were created at different times and for different purposes. According to scripture, some of Satan's fallen angels deviated from their rightful domain by taking on physical form and engaging with humans in ways that were never intended for angels to do. This interaction is depicted in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4, New King James Version. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The term is used to describe the offspring resulting from the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Nevertheless, there were notable individuals of extraordinary size who lived on earth both before and after the flood. The ones before the flood were particularly noteworthy due to their demonic origins. At first glance, there is no indication of angelic or demonic involvement. A passage in Job, on the other hand, provides a better understanding God explains to Job his omnipotence by recounting his power over creation. Job 38 verses 4 to 7, New King James Version Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The morning stars are best interpreted as angels. We also know that mankind had not yet been created when God laid the foundation of the earth, so the reference to the sons of God is another reference to angels, implying that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are also angels. Number 2. The Nephilim were the reason for the flood. According to the Bible, the Nephilim played a significant role in the occurrence of the Great Flood during Noah's time. Following the mention of the Nephilim, the scripture states that God noticed the immense wickedness of mankind on earth, with every thought and inclination of their hearts being evil all the time. Genesis 6 verses 4 to 8, New King James Version There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them." but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God then flooded the entire earth, destroying everything except Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark. Everything else perished, including the Nephilim. God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. 
This means that our rejection of God has reached a point of no return. God will not woo us indefinitely. There will come a time when He says, No more. Even more reason for us to declare that today rather than tomorrow is the day we will respond to Jesus. We have no promise God will draw us some other day. Yet His day will be 120 years. This is interesting as the flood also happened 120 years after his announcement. God was greatly upset by the violation of his established boundaries, leading him to take action. Number 3. There were Nephilim after the flood. It appears that the fallen angels committed their sin again after the flood. However, it is likely that it occurred to a much lesser extent than before the flood. The Israelites returned to Moses with the following information after scouting the land of Canaan. Numbers 13 verse 33 And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. It's also possible that after the flood, the demons mated with human females again, resulting in more Nephilim. It's even possible that some Nephilim characteristics were passed down through the lineage of one of Noah's daughters-in-law. In any case, the Israelites destroyed these giants during their invasion of Canaan. Number 3. The First Mention of the Rephaim the Rephaim are first mentioned in Genesis 14. The Bible relates the political situation that led to Abraham's nephew, Lot, and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah being taken captive. Before that, King Kurda Laoma conquered the Rephaites at Ashtaroth Karnaim. The same king also defeated the Zuzim and the Emim. If we assume that the Rephaim along with the Zuzim and Emim were giants, then the Bible is implying that King Kerdeleoma was a powerful king. He defeated giant armies. As King Kerdeleoma rose to power and consolidated nations and lands, other kings formed a confederation to oppose him. Sodom and Gomorrah were part of the confederation. After the confederation loses in a battle against King Kerdeleoma and his allies, their territory is raided and Lot is among the captives. Abraham learns about these occurrences from a survivor. Abraham gathers his people's arms and leads them into battle, where they join forces with other monarchs to defeat Kerdeleoma. They are successful in the end. Genesis 14 verse 12 and they also took captive Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and left, for he was living in Sodom. The Rephaim, along with the other large people, are mentioned in Deuteronomy 2 verses 20 to 21. Number 4. The Last Rephaim In Deuteronomy 3, there is an interesting story about King Og of Bashan a giant man who was the last of the Rephaim. As we delve into the passages of the Old Testament that speak of the Rephaim, we find that the context of these passages describes them as giants. And while the term Rephaim is often used to describe these towering figures, it is important to note that the Hebrew word Rephaim has two distinct meanings. Firstly, in poetic literature, the word Rephaim is used to refer to departed spirits whose dwelling place is Sheol. This meaning is figurative and serves as a description of the dead, like our concept of a ghost. Secondly, the word Rephaim is used to describe a mighty people with tall stature who lived in Canaan. This meaning does not refer to a specific group, but rather serves as a descriptive term for a group of people with a specific characteristic in this case, tall stature. Og is referred to as the last of the Rephaim in Deuteronomy 3 verse 11 and later in the books of Numbers and Joshua. Rephaim is a Hebrew word for giants. In the days of Moses, 
Og, king of Bashan, was a mighty and infamous Amorite king of Bashan, who reigned at Ashtaroth, who fought the Israelites on their way to the Promised Land. As the Israelites journeyed towards the Promised Land, they encountered many formidable foes, and King Og was one of them. He fought fiercely against the Israelites and led his entire army against them. Before the Israelites fought King Og, they also had to deal with King Sion of the Amorites. But the Lord had already given him and his territory to Israel, so the Israelites had the victory before even starting the battle. Now the king Israel had to deal with was King Og of Bashan, who also sent his entire army against Israel. Og was another Amorite king who posed no threat to Israel because the Lord had already given him and his territory to Israel. Before he even put on his armor, Og's defeat was a foregone conclusion. The Israelites then marched towards Bashan, where King Og confronted them at Edri. Because of Og's reputation, the Israelites were terrified. Do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with his entire army and his land, God assured Moses. The book of Deuteronomy includes a narrative of a conflict that occurred between forces led by Moses and those led by Og. According to the biblical account, Og was the ruler of sixty different walled cities, all of which were taken by the Israelites. When God chose to hand over an enemy to his people, even strong fortified cities were no match for the enemy. Later, at the city of Jericho, the most spectacular demonstration of that truth would occur. Number 5. King Solomon Sang About Giants In order to illustrate God's unwavering commitment to his people throughout the ages, the Israelites frequently praised him by rehashing the story of how they had triumphed over Sion and Og. Psalm 135 verse 7 to 11, New King James Version. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both a man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He defeated many nations. He slew mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. Perhaps you don't know what lies across the valley, but look at that worry in comparison to the Lord God himself and say by faith, The battle is yours, Lord. It is your battle. I lean on you. It is God's love for us that causes him to bring us to an end of our own strength. He sees our need to trust him, and his love is so great that he will not let us live another day without turning over our arms to him, our fears, our worries, even our confusion, so that nothing becomes more significant to us than our Father. Never ever forget it. The battle is the Lord's. There is nothing too difficult for God. Nothing is too difficult for Him. Number 6. There were other names for giants. Moabites and Ammonites both had words for giants, Zuzim and Emim, respectively. It is recorded that the Canaanite word for giants, the Anakim, refers to all the people that lived in Canaan. Number 7. The first mention of the Anakites. The Anakites. The Anakim, or Anakites, were a powerful and aggressive group of giants who lived in the southern region of Israel near Hebron before the arrival of the Israelites. The Anakim's ancestors can be traced back to Anak, the son of Abba, who was regarded as the greatest man among the Anakim at the time. The name Anakim is thought to mean long-necked, according to Hebrew tradition. Number 8. The Promised Land Was Full of Giants Moses sent twelve spies into the Promised Land as Israel reached the Jordan River. 
It was their mission to gather information about the land. Twelve spies entered Canaan, one from each tribe. They were assigned the task of conducting reconnaissance. When they had gone up into Negev, the south country, they came to Hebron, and Ehiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, cluster of grapes, and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between the two of them, with some of the pomegranates and the figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol, Cluster of Grapes, because of the cluster of grapes which the sons of Israel cut down there, when they returned from spying out their land at the end of forty days. Numbers 13. The descendants of Anak were there. This is the first biblical mention of these people. They were significant people and thought to be fierce warriors. Deuteronomy 9 verse 2, New King James Version. A people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? They saw the descendants of Anak in Hebron. What God had promised concerning the land turned out to be accurate. The fact that they were able to bring back fruit, such as grapes, pomegranates, and figs, demonstrates how agriculturally productive and blessed Canaan was. Caleb commanded the people to immediately, at once, trust God, obey God, and take the land. He understood that in the Lord, they were well able to overcome it. It took great courage for this man to stand against the tide of unbelief and doubt. Caleb had the spirit of Romans 3 verse 4, Let God be true, but every man a liar. Numbers 13 verses 31 to 33, New King James Version. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. The unbelieving spies appealed to their authority as those who had seen Canaan's strong cities and people. They believed and said that the facts and practical realities were on their side. The evil report prevailed. Ten fearful men can outshout two brave men. We can infer that the spies were larger than average in size because they described themselves as grasshoppers in their eyes. Furthermore, these children are referred to as giants in the land and mighty men of ancient law, the famous ones in the message translation. Moses exhorted the Israelites not to be afraid of the Anakim, Deuteronomy 1 verse 19, but they refused to believe God's promises. Deuteronomy 1 verses 32 to 33, New King James Version. Yet for all that, you do not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go, in fire by night and in the cloud by day. Due to their actions, God became angry and prevented the evil generation from entering the promised land, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. The Israelite children had to wander in the wilderness for an additional 38 years because they were scared of the Anakim and had rebelled against God. Number 9. Joshua slayed the last Anakites. Joshua and his army began defeating their enemies to take what was theirs. After many battles, the Anakim were the last people to destroy. The earthly giants could not match God's strength. Joshua's army overtook the giants, killing them and taking their land. The only ones remained in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Finally, the Israelites inherited the promised land. Number 10. The relationship between the Anakim and Nephilim. 
The scripture makes it clear that the Anakim and Nephilim are connected, but not interchangeable. These creatures were both tall and feared by the people of that era. While the Nephilim are descended from demons or fallen angels, the Anakim are Anak's descendants with no supernatural ancestry. Both races, however, were evil enough to be exterminated by God and his people. God desires that we believe. Having faith in God's faithfulness is essential. Even if things don't go the way we want, God will always provide for us. God blessed Caleb and Joshua for their faith, and he wants to bless all his children. No matter what challenges we face, we should believe that God is more powerful than any obstacle and can help us overcome it with his strength. Remember, God is bigger than any problem we may encounter.